Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this important discussion about how we continue to build international solidarity for Palestine. My name is Maxine betteridge mose and I am the digital editor at New Internationalist magazine. We are a worker and reader-owned independent media cooperative based in the UK, and we're honored to be able to host this meeting with you all today. It's been almost one year since Israel launched its genocidal campaign on Palestine following the 7th October Hamas attacks that killed nearly 1,200 people. Since then, 12 months of relentless bombing has killed more than 41,000 Palestinians, though the true number is likely to be much higher. Over 90% of Gaza's 2.1 million population are now displaced, and the Strip's infrastructure has been utterly destroyed. Witnessing the genocide unfolding in Gaza has been devastating. As journalists, we've seen our colleagues in Gaza and their family members massacred by Israel as it tries to turn the Strip into a media blackout. Most recently, New Internationalist contributor Wafa Aludani was killed alongside her husband and two children when an Israeli airstrike hit her house on September 30th. The situation has been made worse by the appalling inaction from many of our governments and leaders in the face of Israeli atrocities. Global institutions like the UN have seemed powerless in holding Israel to account and putting an end to the killing, even now as the Israeli military invades Lebanon and expands its bombing campaign into Yemen and Syria, all with the political and financial support of the US, the UK, and many other Western nations. But we cannot afford to be deterred by our global, le by our global leaders' complicity in this genocide, nor their refusal to take meaningful action to stop Israel's flagrant violations of international law. The last year has seen unprecedented numbers around the world taking direct action to disrupt Israel's war machine by building on the work of grassroots campaigners and activists who have been doing this work since well before October 7th. From boycott campaigns to student campus occupations to dock workers refusing to load arms shipments bound for Israel, there is incredible strength and power in our numbers. We must continue to speak out even louder, campaign even harder, and recommit with even greater fervor to one of the most important anti-imperialist, anti-racist human rights struggles of our age. I'm pleased to be joined by five incredible speakers who will talk about the grassroots organizing and movement building within their groups, particularly over the last year, as well as what we can all do to continue working together for a free Palestine and for all oppressed people around the world today. Joining us today are Netta Golan, an Israeli activist and co-founder of the International Solidarity Movement, Israelis Against Apartheid and Return Solidarity. Marin Mantovani, the International Outreach Coordinator at Stop the Wall, a Palestinian grassroots anti-apartheid wall campaign. Karim Ali, co-founder and international coordinator of the Gaza Sunbirds, Palestine's paracycling team that since last October has been providing community-led aid to Gaza. Celia Carbonell, a campaigner with the Coalition Pro Complicitat Am Israel and Complicity with Israel Co Coalition in English, which is a coordination space to break the complicity of Catalan institutions in the violation of the rights of Palestinian people. And Katie Fallon, the advocacy manager at Campaign Against the Arms Trade, a UK based organization working to end the international arms trade. So let's begin. I'd like to start by coming to each of you to tell us a bit more about your organization and the work you do, particularly over the last year. Netta, let's start with you. For having me. I, I was gonna start by paying tribute to my friend Wafail Udeni, and I'm so touched that you've already um, mentioned her. Um, Wafa was, and as you mentioned, was murdered with her. Um, husband and two children in Gaza um, a couple of days ago. Um, and two of her children have uh, uh, survived and are wounded. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to honor her and to say that we're we're all here to 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 continue her uh, her legacy, her to spread the message that she died for uh, spreading. Um, so, and the organization that I'd like to talk about my work um, is the International Solidarity Movement. Even though just as being introduced as an Israeli activist, I have to say Israeli anti-Zionist activist, which I know is sometimes difficult to hold <laughs> together. Um, um, but um, I, yeah, 
feel I need to add that. Um, and the International Solidarity Movement uh, is, is uh, an organization that I co-founded um, back in the outbreak of the, of the Second Intifada, but it's a Palestinian-led movement uh, of mostly self-organizing international volunteers um, that come to support uh, the popular struggle in Palestine. And I hope I have a chance to talk more about it. I don't want to take up too much time right now, but I'll say that the current struggle, the current popular struggle on the ground in the West Bank, because we've been banned, unable to reach Gaza for um, quite a few years now, um, um, is a struggle of sumud. There's an ongoing struggle um, of um, communities, especially in Area C, um, facing forced displacement and the presence of international volunteers uh, can really help the people in their steadfastness, in their clinging to their land, uh, having witnesses to um, deter the settler, the ongoing settler and uh, military uh, attempts to push them off their land. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Netta. It's a real honor to have you here with us today. Um, I'll come to you next, Karim. Can you introduce yourself and the work that you do at Gaza Sunbirds and Athletes for Palestine? Yeah, sure thing. Thanks. Um, so yeah, it's great to speak with everybody. Very happy to be on the panel. Uh, my name is Karim Ali. I'm the co-founder of the Gaza Sunbirds. The Sunbirds are a paracycling team based in the Gaza Strip. We were founded back in 2020. Uh, my co-founder, Ala Dali, he was Palestinian Palestine's uh, cycling champion. And then in 2018, before his first international competition, Alat was targeted by an IDF sniper from 300 meters away from the separation fence. And he lost his leg and he couldn't compete. And I translated a documentary about him. And now five years later, we're running this paracycling team together. Um, the team, I'd say before October 7th, we had 25 athletes about so training five times a week. We had uh, medium, in, like like advanced intermediate athletes. We also had kids between the ages of like 12 and 16. Um, and things things were looking up. It was a tough start. And in, yeah, I mean, October 7th happened and, and life kind of turned around for us. The team had to change what they were doing. Instead of cycling, they started delivering aid parcels on their bikes. Um, we started small. We started with 300 kgs of bread. Ala, who's in the room next to me now, uh, he started by distributing them in Rafah. And since then, we've distributed around $320,000 of food in the Strip in this year, which has uh, kind of big, been a big flip in terms of what we normally do. Um, and we haven't forgotten about the sports. So on April 11th, we evacuated Ala and five other people from Gaza. Uh, I met them in Egypt. And since then, we've been traveling around the world pretty much representing Palestine and in international cycling competitions. Um, Ala is the final of our six original delegation members that is still traveling. And he went from being an amateur cyclist to competing in the Zurich World Championships last week, the Paracycling World Championships, which is the uh, biggest paracycling competition of the year. And I'm very proud to say that he got 17th best in the world in his category. So yeah, that's been what we've been doing this year. And yeah, I guess we're getting ready for a year of this, of this genocide and continuing to push forward with everything we've been doing. Um, just quickly to speak on Athletes for Palestine, we started a campaign back in October trying to get athletes to support Palestine. Um, we were athletes speaking to the athletic world ourselves. We thought that, you know, if they were going to listen to someone, they were going to listen to us. Uh, the campaign's grown quite a bit. We have around 170 members um, and we interact with each other in many different ways from helping us with our training programs and our logistics across the travel to be able to go around and represent Palestine to just doing their own posts and their own initiatives, holding Palestinian flags at events. Um, yeah, so that's a bit about that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kareem. It's really great to have you here as well. Um, I first got to speak to Kareem for a story for New Internationalist a few months ago um, about the Gaza Sunbirds and sort of the, the journey of the team. Um, but a lot has obviously happened since then, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but next, I'd like to come to you, Maren, to tell us a bit about Stop the Wall and the work you've been doing over the last year in particular. 
Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks, Game, for being here with us. I guess uh, that that spirit that you have just told is a spirit that drives us really all. It's uh, or gives us the drive to continue to to struggle uh, side by side with the Palestinian people and supporting them. Um, well, I'm uh, since uh, 2002 International Outreach Coordinator uh, of the Stop the Wall campaign, which is a Palestinian grassroots campaign based, uh, born out of the popular committees in 2002 when Israel started building uh, the apartheid wall in another moment of uh, a uh, dramatic onslaught at that time uh, in the West Bank, the reinvasion massacre in Janine. And then uh, uh, that uh, movement was born out of that one, trying to overcome as well that feeling of uh, uh, everything is lost and it is just overpowering force. And uh, as Karim shows, the Palestinian people is still there and struggling. So what uh, we've been doing over the years, uh, beyond helping to uh, build up the BDS movement is as well, always bringing in new people, uh, new movements uh, that before maybe hadn't thought about uh, the fact that even they can build up uh, uh, and do concrete action for Palestine. Over the last year, we've been working particularly with uh, feminist movements, especially in the global south, uh, overcoming to a certain extent as well, uh, uh, or challenging a Western feminist uh, uh, narrative uh, that was repeating uh, Israeli propaganda instead of actually do what feminism is supposed to be doing, working with uh, climate justice movements and uh, building up uh, uh, boycotts, divestment and sanctions, especially a uh, military embargo on all levels from the grassroots uh, to uh, the United Nations. Thank you so much, Maren. It's really wonderful to have you here as well and really interested to hear more um, about the work you're doing with feminist organizations, uh, particularly in the Global South. Um, next, I'd like to come to you, Celia, uh, who you're joining us from Barcelona. Can you tell us about the work that you're doing there? Thank you very much, and thank you very much for also um, inviting me and having me here. Um, and it's such a pleasure also to to share the this space with with all of you. Um, as um, I said, I'm part of the coalition to end the complicity with Israel, which is a coalition um, from different organizations um, in Catalonia that, that we have been working from 2015 um, to um, put in practice the BDS movement along with um, other like kind of solidarity action with, Palest with Palestinians. Um, we two years ago we were celebrating the the broke the broken of the ties between the Barcelona municipality and the Tel Aviv municipality. So what was one of the biggest campaigns that we we were able no to to undertake. Um, and the last last year we have been um, organizing and mobilizing people all around Catalonia, but also all around Spain. Um, we are quite well coordinating here in Spain. We are also part of a network which is called La Rescop, which is the, the national um, network for solidarity with Palestine in Spain. And we have been able to organize um, more than 10 big protests that it has been taking place in more than 100 cities um, in the same time all around Spain, also here in Barcelona. So that's that's a brief of what we have been doing. Also, we have been campaigning. We have been also raising um, um, allies um, and alliances with, with experts, with artists. We also to enlarge the movement all around all around the country and also, also um, seeking for, for, for boycotting and also end with all the complicity that we have in, from our institutions that also I will be um, explaining a bit, a bit later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Celia. And I know the uh, organization has been successful in stopping some um, arms exports to Israel, which is really great. And we're uh, excited to speak to you more about some of the lessons learned from that. Um, but finally, I'll come to you, Katie, um, to tell us a bit more about the campaign against the arms trade and your work as advocacy manager there. Sure. Thanks very much, Maxine. Um... Yeah, so my name is Katie. I'm advocacy manager at Campaign Against Arms Trade. 
um, also known as CAT or uh, acronym. Um, it's a privilege to be here with all of you and I'm sure lots of you feel the same, like my heart feels very heavy this week uh, in particular. Um, so it's good to be in a room together um, with all of you. Uh, so CAT, yeah, we're a UK based organisation um, working to end the international arms trade. Um, and we specifically focus on UK arms exports. Um, so that's the kind of broad term of uh, weapons, jets, uh, missiles, but also components and technology um, as well. Uh, and all of this requires licenses from the government. So it's private companies sending them, but everything is signed off um, by the government first. Um, so yeah, we're a flat, non-hierarchical organization. Um, we're 50, turning 50 this year, which um, unfortunately shows the need, the constant need for uh, anti-arms trade campaigning. Um, I work on the policy kind of parliamentary side um, and also uh, coordinating some of our legal work um, and supporting others with their legal work. Uh, so you may have heard, I think, yeah, Maxine might have mentioned, um, we previously have taken the UK government to court on arms sales to Saudi Arabia for use in Yemen. Um, so that was kind of through the act of bombardment by the Saudi-led coalition. Um, and we did two judicial reviews against the UK government and having some success there. Uh, so at one point, the court ordered the government to stop issuing new licenses to Saudi because of the um, because, yeah, because of the risk of IHL violations, um, which they unfortunately resumed again. Um, but I think that was one of the first uh, legal challenges to arms sales in the UK. Um, and we knew more coming out of it than we did going in. So this year, then our focus has been on um, Gaza and Israel, um, on UK arms to Israel specifically, and uh, campaigning on that in terms of our grassroots work, um, me in Parliament and supporting our partners, um, Glan and Al-Haq, who are running the case, uh, yeah, challenging UK arms exports to Israel um, for this past year. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Katie. Yes, we've uh, done a fair bit of reporting um, with the help of the Campaign Against the Arms Trade for Union Internationalist, um, and we've got an upcoming issue about the global arms trade, um, which should be very interesting coming out uh, early next year. Um, so we have just over an hour and a half, um, and we'll have plenty of time for audience questions, but we'll jump into the panel itself now. Um, I want to start with you, Netta. Uh, the International Solidarity Movement invites activists to visit Palestine and show solidarity with the Palestinian struggle on the ground. Can you tell us a bit more about the role of international activists in Palestine and also the role of returning activists in building and connecting solidarity movements in their home countries? Thank you. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, uh, our... Uh, movement is a Palestinian-led movement. And what that means is that internationals, uh, international activists that come to Palestine, we don't initiate, ISM doesn't initiate any, any action. We join uh, on invitation of Palestinian communities to support uh, the actions, the, uh, the popular resistance that they're engaged in. And that's changed over, over the years since uh, ISM was founded. And at the moment, the most intense, um, I mean, there's a couple of uh, intense things going on, but uh, the thing we do the most uh, since before October 7th, actually, after this uh, new right-wing Israeli government came into uh, power, they began on their plan of like implementing like the second Nakba and they started uh, expelling Palestinian communities in area C. And then after October 7th, that um, uh, intensified, um, you know, the settlers used the cover of what was happening and to just, you know, show up in communities and give people like 24 hours to leave or, um, you know, they'll kill them. And uh, up until now, at least 19 communities have basically uh, been forcefully dis displaced in the last year uh, in the West Bank, um, in Area C. And we have invitations from these communities to come and, and, and stay with them. And, you know, when we're there, we can report. There have been cases where, for example, if there is this kind of threat of you have 24 hours or we'll kill you. So, you know, we also 
have people there who talk to their consulates about this threat and um it 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 has helped people uh stay specifically we started in Safar Yakta uh where there are also Israeli activists working um and the ISM is working with the with the communities there and it has uh, there were some communities that left before our um numbers got uh, got bigger but but things have been stable. Uh, there was a community that came back because of a court order and left again. The harassment is on is 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 so intense. Uh, the settler and uh, the settler and military harassment and um, um, but people are managing to stay. And we've just recently um, started also uh, having a protective presence in uh, the Jordan Valley. And we only recently expanded because like the worst thing we can do is start presence somewhere and then leave because then the settlers will like attack with a vengeance. So we can only expand and, you know, go to new places when we believe that we have enough activists, you know, that are going to keep coming. And our numbers are growing. Unfortunately, most recently, I think the reason that we have we have a surge of numbers is because one of our activists was murdered in a demonstration in Beta, uh, Aisha Noor, um, and um, the she uh, Aisha Noor was uh, the 18th demonstrator in Beta to be murdered before since 2020. There have been 17 uh, demonstrators in Beta uh, murdered uh, while protesting against the theft of the land. Um, um, by the set, by a, a settlement outpost, um, and and Ashner was the 18th, and uh, so that's another thing that our activists can do. There's nothing if you volunteer with the ISM that you have to do, but if you want to do it, when there are there are communities right now in the West Bank, uh, uh, Beta and well, Kifar Kadun might have also stopped. Not Beta are really continuing their demonstrations and on pop, you know, demonstrations there are activists that want to join and support. Um, and Aisha uh, was one of them. So because of her murder, um, we got a lot of attention and paradoxically or not, beautifully, you know, we've been swamped with people wanting to volunteer uh, since then. Um, so we have able to expand to the Jordan Valley as well. And I'll just end by, you know, kind of putting out an invitation and saying, well, no, I want to talk about going home. You know, obviously people like coming here, yes, we, there, there's a there's a need. But the most important part of it is 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 going home and continuing uh the work because obviously the the root of the problem, <laughs> I mean, okay, there, there's 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 Israel, but without, as we all know, without the international support. Um, without international support, the Palestinians could deal with Israel. <laughs> they wouldn't, you know, they did, don't need help from the Palestinian community to deal with Israel. They need is they need the, the international community to stop supporting Israel, and the Palestinians could deal with Israel just fine, you know. Um, so, so we need people to go home and to work on ending complicity, of course, as uh, you know, heeding the call of the Palestinian BDS movement that so many people, especially, I mean, I know Marin's work on supporting the, the, the movement, um, but so many of us. So um, yeah, that's that's the going home. We think that people coming here and it's really important to have that connection with Palestinians. Uh, um, so we, we know not only what we're fighting against, which is so horrific and we see it sometimes, um, but what we're fighting for, because those of us who had the privilege and the honor of of uh, getting to know Palestinians, uh, there's so much uh, worth fighting for. Um, so I think when people come here, they connect with that, and hopefully they stay connected, um, and and that fuels uh, our our work back in our own countries. Thank you so much, Netta. It's such an important point as well when we think of uh, the dehumanizing narratives in a lot of mainstream media when it comes to 
Palestinians and just generally the lack of media coverage at the moment in, in Gaza. It's so important for those that are able to go and, and meet communities and spend time with the communities to really build that connection. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'll come to you next, Maren. If uh, you mentioned sort of in your introduction, the work that you're doing with feminist movements, uh, particularly in the global South, and uh, you've done a lot of international outreach coordination with various other popular movements working for Palestinian rights around the world. Can you tell us a bit more about those partnerships and also some of the lessons that can be learned from them? Well, thanks a lot. And I actually just want to come in with the good news. While we were speaking, the news came that Portuguese uh, prime minister has announced that Portugal will not give any airspace anymore for military cargoes going uh, uh, to Israel. And I think that's a great news. Portugal seems small, but the airspace is quite central and crucial because it's on the way from the US to, uh, uh, to Israel. Uh, I guess I'll circle back to more around that in the second question that you point me to uh, give me, but I just thought a good news is always something you and shouldn't hide. Um, but yeah, I mean, all that uh, uh, work and all, all these news as well are not coming out of anything uh, than the hard work of uh, so many uh, uh, thousands and millions of people across the globe. And I've been uh, lucky enough to, uh, to work with uh, many of them over the last uh, two decades. And uh, as Stop the Wall, as Palestinian Graphics and the Apartheid Wall campaign, uh, there has been, right from the beginning, uh, questioning uh, of uh, where Palestinian outreach uh, needs to be and that it needs to be really global. It cannot be focused only on Europe and the US, but it needs to work crucially with the allies uh, in the anti-colonial struggle across the globe. So we have reached out there uh, reached out there for the last uh, one and a half decades really working quite intensively around Asia, Africa and Latin America. And uh, one argument that we had and we've built up was a bit uh, what we have put into the slogan for world without walls. Taking that idea that uh, the wall uh, in Palestine or the walls in, uh, in Palestine, uh, the world has taken them, was shocked first, and instead of dismantling them, have just uh, reproduced them. And it has become a model to have walls. The US have walls, in Europe we have walls, everywhere we have walls. And taken that a bit as a symbol of what is happening in the world today, that you have uh, uh, Israel, like Gustavo Pedro, the president of Colombia, said already last, last October, Gaza is the model for a world where we are all uh, dispensable. The idea that Israel is a model, the way how they produce, uh, produce repression, produce uh, spaces of death uh, and destruction, that is not only sticking to the Palestinians. So. The question is as well, and then going out and talking with movements from across the globe, that Palestine is a question that touches each and everyone in particular, um, in the sense that Israel exports technology, methodology, ideology of repression, weapons, uh, whatever it is. And that means that communities across the globe, especially in the global south, uh, are being targeted by those weapons. On the other hand, evidently, the fact that it's not only in the global south, with, with the idea of world without walls, we've built as well quite some interesting campaigns with the migrants movements in uh, across uh, the European continent, um, where uh, Frontex uh, and European, uh, not only uh, EU, but as well Britain are working with the technology and me methodology of Israel to uh, repress uh, migrants uh, uh, that are coming, that are staying in their countries, and all those that are uh, at the front lines of, of repression, and building up the, these kind of interconnections and movements uh, uh, has been actually quite fundamental in broadening the movement for Palestine. 
Um, the feminist uh, outreach to the feminist movement really is one of the most recent ones over the last uh, year. And it was interesting that while in, uh, in Europe very much there was this discourse about the bad Arab that had come to brutalize uh, uh, the white woman, really, that was a discourse around 7th of October, in the Global South, feminists uh, and women have never bought that. So uh, there has been a spontaneous coming together of feminist networks uh, in Latin America first and then in Africa as well, well, that have taken and have made the 24th of November the day against internet, uh, against uh, violence, uh, gender violence, and then the 8th of March as days in solidarity for Palestine and really transformed discourse in action uh, in that sense. And I guess the key point here that uh, we've always seen that helped in mobilizing was on the one hand, just listening what the problems are that movements across the world are facing. And I've never encountered in 20 years of work something that was repression across the world, dispossession across the world, that wasn't in a way or another connected or connectable with what is happening in Palestine. And that has built the backbone for effective struggle. And that kind of listening together with a, a strategic thinking of how we do our research, do, do our strategic efforts in order to think uh, that not only we denounce, but we actually win. Uh, don't whine, win. Uh, thinking about how we can together overcome uh, the uh, repression, the injustice, and actually think where we can make that tiny little difference that uh, BDS has given us as a methodology to actually su succeed. Thank you so much, Marin. We're going to come back to um, some more conversation around BDS, um, but really great to hear the work that you're doing. And um, yeah, I think the silence from a lot of Western feminists and feminist movements has been quite deafening, um, but great to hear a lot of the work uh, that you're doing, especially with feminist movements across the global South that uh, tell a different story. Um, I want to come to you next, Katie, uh, to talk a bit more, um, a nice sort of segue from the news of the Portuguese government um, stopping its airspace for arms transport. Um, in early September, the UK government announced that it would suspend 30 out of some 350 arms export licenses to Israel following a review of Israel's compliance with international humanitarian law. Can you tell us a bit about the role that activists in the UK played uh, in this decision to suspend these arms export licenses? And is this suspension enough? I think we all know the answer to that. Um, but what do you think needs to be done to really push the UK and other governments further to actually suspend all arms licenses to Israel? Yes, you know what? I think I actually might answer those questions backwards um, just so yeah, people have a bit more info on what this suspension was um, because a really critical thing about it is that the government in their own comms and you know the statement that the foreign secretary David Lamy made about this downplayed what it actually was um, and there's just been this kind of um, this I don't know how to, like a dynamic throughout the last year where they're actually having to do more internally because they know how wrong they are and they know like how clear these IHL violations are. Um, but then for political reasons are trying to make it seem like they haven't done as much as they have. Um, so kind of that kind of first thing I wanted to say is that this suspension is actually very significant. While like 30 out of 350 and we need to get more details because they haven't, you know, they've kept all the information about what these licenses are and how they've made the assessment and which are which um, private for now, they won't be able to keep all that information um, secret. But what we do know is that maybe half ish of what hasn't been um, what hasn't been suspended are dual use items. These could, these could be for civilian use, not necessarily always weapons. I mean, that, that's still a big question on that. Um, but also how they've downplayed it, where they've said they've excluded the F-35 jet program, which is the most significant thing that we export from the UK. It could be, you know, kind of looking at numbers, it could even be 
near 40 percent of what we send like we can't get an accurate estimate of that because of um a lack of transparency but it's very significant um but they've said yeah that whole program's excluded whereas in reality on the license they've had to say we're not sending anything directly to israel anymore we're just sending components via third countries because they know that legally um they're on really shaky footing uh so i just kind of wanted to set that up as yeah, while it isn't enough and while we have to focus on pushing for the F-35 um, exclusion to end, it's still a massively, um, a massively significant victory. And, you know, I think I've been like in my own head and like describing with my colleagues this last year of this campaign has been like a wave and every single drop in the wave counts. We you know we're up against such powerful forces, like the most powerful forces I think that we could be up against, you know, like U.S., military supremacy, um, genuinely the military industrial complex that sustains itself from war. Um, I think seeing where our government's allegiances have been, and they've not been with the people of the UK who've been out marching every two weeks um, for the past year. Uh, there's, you know, there's other interests like you can see this, I don't know if anyone's seen um, the Keir Starmer statement today where, you know, he really reiterated that the UK stands by Israel in, you know, come what may, um, only seems concerned by violence when it's committed by Iran or by Hezbollah and anything committed by Israel just not, um, doesn't, the no need to condemn, no need to discuss. Um, so if there hadn't been for activists putting pressure on their MPs, if MPs hadn't been writing to the government, if there hadn't been massive media attention on this story all year, we wouldn't have got where we are and we wouldn't have got the government to admit that, yes, there is I mean, at the very least a risk of IHL violations. And we know that it's far more than that. Thanks, Katie. That's really great, actually, to have that point around the significance and that every drop counts. I think that's really important, as we said earlier, when everything feels so heavy and we're up against such an incredible force. I think that's really an important point to drive home. Um, and then just keeping the the discussion on uh, sort of the arms trade for now and activism around that, um, to come to you, Celia, next, uh, to describe some of the successful tactics that your movement has used, particularly against the Spanish government, um, to stop arms exports to Israel. And can you share some of the lessons you've learned um, through this work? So basically also following um, what, what my colleagues were saying, um, it was for us the the way to find uh, the channel to 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 bring up a Palestinian historic demand against our government to really um, um, like reporting um, the relations and the complicities that they were having with Israeli um, regime regarding the the buy and the sell of of arms trades. Um, so basically, it was the beginning the the need to create a campaign, um, a campaign that now has more than. 500 organizations that they endorse that um, around the, the, the country, which is supported by six um, political parties, which, which are the, all the political parties from the left um, of the government, of the Spanish government, and the main um, unions um, in, in, the, in the Spanish level as well. So one of the biggest um, 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 opportunities that we see is like the importance to bring um, organizations and unions activists all together in this campaign and to try to find the work and um, the way to work closely also with experts. So what we have with this campaign is the, um, to have uh, to put the strategy like the our strategic efforts to have the numbers, to have the data, to have the information to then then bring it up against the government because we have a problem here in Spain that um, the Spanish government is perceived as the most progressive um, um, government all around Europe. But um, thanks to this campaign, we have been um, able to show how the government has been lying for the last month because we know that when the government was declaring in November that they stop um, all the license with Israel he was um, getting um, arms um, every month, and it was the um, European country that was buying more um, arms um, all around Europe. Um, so it was, you know, to being able to identify that lie and also to to bring it up and and to so that work it has been done thanks to the to work with experts organization that has been working on this issue for many many years also to work with different organizations in different levels, to work with artists, to bring all these people together that can make one 
one claim, which is to to stop arms with Israel and to to put all this um, to show the complicity that the Spanish government is still committing um, until today. Um, for now, we have been able to to stop the 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 exports, so like the license that they have been um, um, approving. But we have a big problem here in Spain, um, that is that Spain, uh, Spain is still um, buying arms monthly. And also it's it's being a, a place that um, ships and boards, uh, boats are, are stopping when transiting um, full of arms and military fuel. So also our campaign now is also to put pressure to really show that um, these boats are arriving to, to Spanish coasts and are, are stopping um, to get fuel or to get um, to stop for a few days. So um, being able to identify this kind of boats, to being able to follow up them, uh, we have been able to stop two of them as well, um, and we have been able that um, to put um, enough pressure on the government. So it has been denied that one um, boat full of arms um, did not stop um, in Spain. So we have been trying to put and raise up this social pressure, basically thanks to the pressure of people um, and centralizing this demand in our protests. We had been um, calling on, on the streets to stop armed with Israel um, in, in, in social media, in our protests, in every place we go, because we think it's an important um, it's an important demand that has been, and uh, it would be significant. It's a legal and moral obligation for the Spanish government to to do to end um, up, uh, all the complicity with with the uh, um, Zionist states. So um, it has been thanks to that that we have been also able to identify other um, other like. Um, Congress and activities that has been taking place all around um, Spain, Barcelona, and Catalonia regarding Congress um, of Arms that um, uh, Israeli companies are invited. So also um, they, we, they show the relations and the complicities from our municipalities, from our governments, and and all all around with all the political parties um, in Spain. So it has been also very important to being able to boycott this Congress to to really try to stop them. In one occasion, we were able to stop. Um, um, a showing of arms and drones um, happening in a city here in Barcelona. So it was very important to put the pressure to mobilize people in front of these um, of the spaces that this Congress um, are taking place to really show and to really um, make the, the political cost of such actions to be every day higher and higher and higher. So we think it's very important that this kind of actions that that happen that happen monthly um does not remain in silence so we can bring it up show to the people and really show that um spanish government is still very complicit with with israel even though no um has um in terms of the narrative that is assuming it's showing um its solidarity um with palestinians um and also we have been trying to find all the channels to transit all these this information. So also we have been um, suing the Spanish government for the because it's also breaching one of the, the Spanish um, laws um, regarding the the exportation of uh, and the buying and the selling of arms with Israel. So also the Palestinian Community of Catalonia, which is part of our coalition, um, presented a, a criminal complaint against the government, which is now has been denied and rejected, but now is is waiting for the. Supreme Court to to take uh, another look and to see if it could be uh, a way to also stop and make the the government being able to um, implement a military embargo, which would be the the tool to stop all this complicity. So that's not about the political will to do that and and to say to us that it has been. Um, um, taking our consideration, our 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 claims, but it's also to really take a, a concrete action that could really stop all these all these complicity. So we have been trying to raise opposition against the government, to raise also the topic, and to to combine to combine um, grassroots movements with unions, with people, with artists. So now what we have now is a a, a very a, huge movement that is it's moving all together um against against this knowing that it's a very concrete action that could be uh, a big um chain change for 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 spain and, and for the world because it would be a significant also action to also for other states to take the example and do so so we have been working on that we are going to keep working um 
knowing that that the doors are open so we hope that we can put in pressure we will um get what we we miss thank you so much silly i think it's a really important point too around um you know like you said working with artists trade unionists people from all different walks of life um being part of this movement and i think that brings us nicely to you karim to talk specifically when it comes to sports um, and the work that you've been doing through the Gaza Sunbirds on the international sporting stage, so to speak. Um, you've just returned from Zurich in Switzerland, where Allah, your co-founder and Palestinian athlete, um, participated in the Paracycling World Championships, uh, which was a first for a Palestinian athlete. Can you tell us a bit about what it took to get there, uh, particularly over the last year? Um, and who the people and the different forces are that power the movement behind the Gaza Sunbirds and Athletes for Palestine? Yeah, of course. I mean, just to start off by saying that I feel very emotional and very happy to hear what the other speakers are saying. I mean, it's very clear that whatever we're doing internationally is working. And today is Portugal. Tomorrow it will be Spain. And hopefully there'll be a day very soon where they can get their bombs across the Mediterranean. And then what will they do? So I think it's just a matter of time. And these things, unfortunately, they take time. Actually, Ala was sitting next to me and he just said one word to describe everything I was translating for him. And it's just, it's powerful. And and there's a lot of power in it. So yeah, more power to you all and, and what you're doing. So um, yeah, getting Ala to Zurich was close to impossible, I would say. Uh, who fuels the summer? So let's start with that. So the the jewel in our crown is our team in Gaza. There's absolutely no negotiation about that. Um, Alat was part of that team in Gaza. We were working together for around five years now. And our team is still out there giving out food, distributing parcels, managing refugee camps, trying their best to kind of support their communities any, any way that they can. And it's really... You know, having our work at the moment rooted with Gaza, rooted with getting stories out of there, that's facilitated us making it out onto the world stage. And Alat played a big role in that. He was in Gaza for 192 days of the genocide uh, before he left. And thankfully, you know, we left the team in, a, in very capable hands and the aid distributions have continued going even without us. And I think to both of us, that gives us some comfort that, you know, what we've built has become bigger than ourselves and the Sunbirds are are there and, and ticking along. Um, internationally, there's so many people to thank and there's so many people involved in the kind of process. I mean, we have a team of 55, 56 volunteers internationally that just manage everything for us from inboxes to DMs to posting to, it's what brings the Sunbirds to the people, to everybody. Um, I, I feel like my role in the Sunbirds has always been just a storyteller. I just kind of translate what's happening into videos, into websites, into, into text pieces. But I mean, since this genocide started, there's so many more people that are helping with that. So many athletes that are coming along to help with that as well. So many sports professional staffs, federation. We've been working together more. Um, getting out of Gaza has been impossible for five years. I mean, and, and romantically, or not romantically, rather, it all starts with a bullet. It's the same thing that you guys are trying to stop them from getting. Um, Alat was shot by a bullet, and it ended his sports dream. But bullets and bombs and hundreds of dreams in Gaza, thousands of dreams in Gaza every single day. In fact, they've taken away all dreams in Gaza at this point. Um, for five years, we were trying to leave, and we couldn't. We were trying to build a cycling team in a in a barren wasteland, in a, in a prison where nothing could get in. Bikes weren't allowed in. We trained without helmets. We started training without shoes. When you have one leg, you need shoes to clip into your pedal so that it can kind of rotate. But we didn't even have that. The guys just started off by tying their shoes with a piece of string onto their pedal. That's way before this genocide even happened. Mid-November, the IDF absolutely destroyed the community center that our bikes were in. So we had no more bikes. They destroyed 13, 14 bikes. Or stole them, who knows. Um, so these are all just challenges from the get-go in terms of getting a lot out. Fast forward to April, May of this month. I mean, there's the Rafah border crossing and all of the complexities that are in that. When a Palestinian makes it to Egypt, they have rights for about 30 days and then they can't get a bank account. They can't get a phone number. They can't get visas issued. They can't do anything. They become effectively zero rights as a person. Um, so our first challenge was getting Allah out of Gaza. That took 
the world to come together. I had to go to Egypt and, and, and get that done. And then when he kind of came out, we had two separate movements running, one to get the team of six to Belgium and the other to get the team of six to Italy. So we launched two international campaigns, had something like 200,000 signatories in order to push that forward. Um, actually, the Italian embassy complained. They actually had to call us at one point to tell us if we receive any more emails in our inbox, we will not be able to process your visa application because they were receiving an email every two minutes from our supporter to push them to, to give us visas. So from the get-go, even getting there, it was a battle. And every step of the way has been a struggle. I mean, the situation in Gaza definitely hasn't made it any easier. Um, whether it's visas or the Rafah invasion, I mean, by the middle of our, by the start of our trip, Rafah was invaded. All of our athletes and staff dropped out and they couldn't because they'd effectively become stateless overnight. They had no way to return to Gaza. The Israelis came in and absolutely destroyed the Rafah border crossing. Um, and so they were effectively stranded abroad. So yeah, it's a, it's a big team that kind of fuels this movement. We've also been very lucky to work with Olympic athletes like Mark Rowan on training programs. There's this entire sports element of the work that we do that's all just navigating very pointless bureaucracy um, that is an uphill learning curve as well. So we've had to do that. Uh, so that's really how, how, we, how we manage it. But we are 100% crowdfunded. We're 100% funded by our supporters, uh, by people within the movement. Without everybody, none of the work we did would have been possible. So uh, it's always just been about building a community around sports, building a community around hope and Sports has a unique way to transcend borders. You don't need a language to understand the importance or the, the journey that an athlete has had to go through. Uh, we've had the honor of experiencing that at every turn of our athletic journey. You know, when we first got to Belgium, we needed a new chain for our bike and the Irish team came and fixed it for us. We needed new wheels, they got it for us. Uh, when we needed some training support, the Saudi team actually had our back. And, and this is the thing with, with sport generally, it's like, it so often reflects life. Sport and life can't really be separated from each other. Um, and so in our journey, what we try to do is we just try to show the impact that life has on us, what the borders do, what the siege does, what the bullets do, what the bombs do. And we just try to tell our authentic story, uh, trying to bring Palestinian culture forward to the world. And yeah, I'm very grateful for the huge team that has our back doing this. Thanks, Kareem. I want to come to Amaran next to talk a little bit about the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement. But just before we do, I was wondering if you've talked a lot about how uh, the international community has really come together in support of Palestinian athletes and in support of the in support of the Gaza Sunbirds. Can you talk a little bit about, on the flip side of that, uh, the power of boycotting in sports and the need for boycotting in sports? Is this something that the Gaza Sunbirds also kind of organize around when it comes to um, Israel's compete competition in sports. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how BDS, the role of BDS within the sporting community? For sure. Um, so I have to admit, this is a, a tricky conversation for us to navigate because there's implications with regards to Allah's competition and being able to compete in competitions. So how I try to frame the Sunbirds, generally speaking, is like we're living what's being lived. Um, and hopefully people can use that to campaign for what is needed to liberate us and to bring to bring peace. Um, it's it's really tough being a Palestinian athlete. It's really tough being a Palestinian coach. Uh, you know, this year, Israel had 88 competitors inside the Olympics, for example. They had seven gold medalists. Three of them were in sailing. And... Palestinians aren't allowed to go to the beach and sail. Um, Ala became the cycling of Palestine, uh, Pal cycling champion of Palestine, only to be shot by a bullet in the leg and to end his career. It's the same is true for so many different athletes. I mean, sports isn't to be understated, right? Like back in the Cold War, the Americans and the Soviets were going up against each other in sports. Sports was a major arena. It was a way to prove that my ideology is better than your ideology. Look at what athletes I'm, I'm pushing out. Um, and I mean, statistically, the countries that have the higher GDP have the most amount of medals won inside the Olympics. It's, it's, it's just the way that the world works. Sports costs so much money. So when we kind of look at 
all of the opportunities that are being taken away from Palestinian athletes right now. I just spoke at the UCI Congress last week and I told them that we managed to get out of here by a literal miracle. And I have no guarantee that we're going to be able to take an athlete to the next world championships. And what I did is I asked the UCI for help to get athletes out of Gaza to try or Palestine to try to train them abroad. Obviously, it's going to be much easier said than done. But the reality is that nothing that we can do, no amount of superficial or cosmetic solutions will change the reality of the situation on the ground now, which is that we are being penalized for living through a genocide in the sports world. And how the international community reacts to that, I think it's just a matter of time. I, I think this year we only had seven people in the Olympics. We had one para-athlete, both that were supposed to come from the West Bank struggled to come out. And so in this sports arena, it's, it's about showing legitimacy. You know, Palestine isn't recognized as a state. The sports world is one of the few places where our flag flies as equal to everyone else around us. Um, when Israel has 88 athletes competing in the Olympics, that legitimizes them. And I mean, a lot of Europeans, when you speak to them, they might have heard of Israel. Some people might have heard of Palestine as Israel's neighbors, you know? So really getting that kind of visibility is so important and so important also in the cultural battle against what's happening at the moment. So I think that there has to be a correction that's done at some point in the sports world to, to, to make an equal playing field or to fix this imbalance that the Israelis have caused by shooting, maiming, bombing, destroying our homes, displacing us, killing our families, burning our land, you know? Um, think of some solutions for it, but yeah. I think that that's I think it's going to be very important. So I'm very for any movements that kind of try to put pressure within the sports world or that try to support Palestinian athletes. Um, in the end of the day, we want to play. We have a right to play. It's a game. It shouldn't be like we shouldn't be used as political objects because of the fact we're Palestinian. We shouldn't be held back from competing, from going out because of the fact that we're Palestinian. We shouldn't be, have to go through hoops and run international campaigns to get visas just because of the fact that we're Palestinian. We should be able to train as a team from the West Bank and Gaza and not be separated just because of the fact that we're Palestinian. It's it is so it's so fundamental to how everyday happens, you know. Um, and so pushing for equality within sports, pushing for our rights within sports, is the same as pushing for our rights within everyday life. Because without life, there's no sports. That's that's how I would summarize it. Thanks so much, Kareem. That's really interesting and important to hear. And um, please pass on, I think I can speak for everyone, please pass on our congratulations to Allah and the rest of the team for everything that they've done to get to this point. Um, and so I want to come next to Marin to talk a little bit more broadly about BDS. Uh, you're, in addition to your work with Stop the Wall, a representative for the BDS National Committee which leads the global BDS movement. Can you tell us how you've seen support for BDS evolve over the last year and how effective the call for boycott, divestment and sanctions is in the struggle to stop Israel's war crimes, particularly as now we're heading into the second year of this genocide? Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, not having the restrictions that are put on Karim and uh, Allah, I would just uh, take my own conclusion of what they said, is that as long as Palestinians from Gaza, from the West Bank and from Haifa cannot play together, Israel needs to be kicked out of the Olympics, of the FIFA, and wherever it is. And there are lots of campaigns around there. And uh, yeah, join them. Um, on the other hand, um, definitely, I mean, BDS has grown exponentially over the last year. We've been, uh, we've never seen so many people, not only out in the streets, but calling for sanctions, calling for a military embargo, mobilizing on boycotts. We, we would have never imagined that only in a few months, uh, a mammoth uh, uh, company like McDonald's is uh, posting significant losses because people just didn't go there anymore. Um, many other companies uh, uh, have posted losses because of the boycotts uh, 
Intel has uh, uh, cancelled uh, 25 billion con uh, investment into uh, into Israel, and many other uh, others have been uh, seen and withdrawing from uh, um, uh, Israel and their complicity. But I think the most important and most impressive victories have been around uh, military ties and military uh, relations, because that's as well the most urgent at the moment. Stop getting the, those bullets in. And not only stop getting the bullets in, get, stop getting the bullets out as well, because there is the other aspect of Israel being a major producer of, of weapons across the globe. And those weapons uh, are being ironically paid mostly by the global south where they're uh, being exported. And that kind of uh, trade is fueling and financing the Israeli military industrial complex. So while evidently, and especially from Europe, the key focus is on not bringing the weapons in, I think the general view has al uh, always needs to be no military ties at all, whether that's export, whether that's import, whether that's uh, uh, military training, whether that's uh, uh, research and development, and European countries are as well very good in fueling the research and development of Israeli military industries. So there is a lot... Uh, uh, to unpack here. But as we've seen really from the news from Portugal, the news from the UK and so on, uh, with especially the genocide uh, case uh, that South Africa has brought uh, uh, in front of the International Court of Justice and now the UN General Assembly resolution that for the first time in 42 years has talked about sanctions again and including a stop of exports and transfer. <coughs> of military components uh, to Israel. So uh, uh, there has been uh, a moment where countries are really trying at least to limit and very often at least to hide what they're doing. Uh, Israel transfer, transfers and exports to Israel now need to be seriously investigated. Nobody is uh, boasting uh, about them anymore. Uh, and I think that is already a step forward, not sufficient. Uh, ties are being slowly cut. And I think one uh, uh, important aspect about uh, not only cutting, um, and that is super important, uh, export licenses, but as well, the whole transfer. And uh, Celia was talking about uh, the case of the, of the vessels. Uh, we're just having now, while we are speaking, another, another vessel, the MV Catherine, which we thankfully uh, got hold of before uh, the vessel was uh, trying to stop in Namibia. And Namibian uh, authorities were doing their job. They were investigating and they were transparent that they found 150,000 kilos of uh, very rare explosive that Israel necessarily needs in order to continue to build weapons on that ship, going to Israeli military industries uh, uh, um, with an import license uh, from the Israeli Ministry of Economy. And since then, Angola hasn't let them dock. Uh, now she, uh, the Catherine is in the after uh, the vessel has more than a month of delay in the Adriatic, Montenegro doesn't let her dock, uh, Slo Slovenia doesn't want to let her dock, uh, we're now looking into Croatia. <coughs> Portugal doesn't want, doesn't want to give them the flag anymore. We're calling for everybody not to give the Catherine a flag in order to continue the journey of those uh, uh, criminal uh, uh, cargo. But what we've learned in that whole thing is that that whole operation of transfer and most of the transfer of, of weapons is not going through military planes or ship, but actually commercial planes and commercial ship. And there is a whole lot of complicity involved from the countries that are giving the flag, from the ship owner, from the operating uh, company, from the docks that are 
uh, the, the ports that are giving, giving docking rights. And all these companies are very often sitting somewhere around Europe, including in the UK. And those companies do not want to have troubles. They are running business operations. And if we put pressure on them, that's another way to actually stop that trade and those weapons from coming in. So uh, there is a whole lot to, to unpack and to learn on how we are looking at this whole complex uh, way on getting uh, weapons to Israel and how we can stop them. <clears throat> and I guess I've already sp uh, spoken too much, but I want to just uh, get in one point that uh, was the second last question that uh, you put me um, about the impact. I mean, the impact is clear. The impact should have been there 76 years ago. The impact is not good enough yet, but we see that we're making a step forward and that step needs to be continued. And I guess after a year of genocide, uh, we just do not have the luxury to stop. We may be tired, but we need to find new energy and we need to really learn from people in Gaza to wake up every morning and get active again and get new people in. If you feel tired, then get another three new people in, then you can even do more. I think uh, it's just now the moment that we need to step our, up our efforts. Uh, being tired, being frustrated is just not a luxury we have, none of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mara. No, that's really, really great to hear and really informative. Um, it sort of leads me as well into the next question. We've... Um, Net has just had some tech issues getting back in, but we should have her back hopefully soon. Um, I know we've talked a lot up until this point around uh, some of the successes that various movements have had and what it's taken to get to this point. Um, I wanna talk next to everyone a little bit about what some of the biggest obstructions are to the movement and some of the biggest challenges that you face um, in terms of building up stronger and, and taking more actions. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Katie, first. Um, if you can, yeah, talk about what the biggest obstructions to the movement have been and how you're working to sort of circumvent them. Yeah, I think, I think my kind of the ones I know more intimately would connect, say, with my work in Parliament. And while they're obstructions, they also give me, the, to, every time I see something, look, I'll describe what I mean. I, like we did a briefing in Parliament. Um, it was like, Kat, uh, Al Haq and Glan, who were running the legal case um, in kind of early March. And that was March, April was when the campaign really started to like, heat up. Like, I think that's basically when we kind of almost won the campaign in terms of the suspension that we have. Um, but just the government sat on legal advice that said it shouldn't be sending arms exports from basically April up until September through the election. Um, and like a day or two after that, you know, a lord wrote a hit piece in the Telegraph, you know, accusing Kat and others of warfare and trying to discredit us. Um, I think around that same week or two, Boris Johnson, former prime minister, took it upon himself to write like a really atrociously horrible article in the Daily Mail. Um, I think some of the things he said in that are like amongst the most horrible things I've read in um, over over this last year, you know, saying that the suffering of others, we, that will weaken our resolve and we have to keep sending arms exports. Um, which is just, just like, I, I can't really think of something more disgusting and to come from a former prime minister. Like these are the people who have the most power. Um, so when they kind of hit back, we kind of see how close to the center of power that we're actually trying to get at. But seeing the, getting a rise out of them, I know what we're doing is working um, and that they wouldn't be writing these pieces if we weren't getting close and that our movement is really powerful. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Thanks, Katie. Um... I'll come to you next, Celia, as well, to talk more from the Spanish context, uh, what some of the challenges you've you've faced and how you're working around them. 
So basically what we're, we're finding here in Spain, um, as I explained before, it is like um, it's quite challenging to 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 report um, what what the Spanish government is doing if it's covered in this um, in this layer of of this socialist no socialist government which is very progressive um, that from one one side it it sides with Palestine recognizes the Palestinian state but it keeps lying and lying about arms exports so um, it's quite challenging for the narrative and for because of the media coverage that we are having here in Spain that it always put the the Spanish government along with with Palestine but we know that that also the lack of transparency that we are meeting and we are finding regarding how to get information and how to really have the numbers um of the the money that the the Spanish um, um, state is it's also um, giving to Israel buying and buying arms, which is completely something that it's we cannot um, allow to happen. It's really complicated to find. So also what it, we are finding is that we are a grassroots movement. We are um, activists. We are people that we have been working for for many 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 years. Um, here um, in Barcelona, in Catalonia, but all around Spain, along with the Palestinian communities um, that are organizing the different um, areas. But so, and sometime also to raise the campaign and to talk about things that they are quite um, legal and, and it could be some a big challenge for us because sometimes it's too institutional, it's too legal, it's too um, specific. That That's why also we're trying to build up and and to strength the, the ties that we have with experts that can allow us us also to bring this campaign up and, and to make it happen and also because we are available we are completely aware that it should be the the union of all of us which could bring um, the Spanish government in this case accountable so also um, that's why also it's, uh, it's another challenging that we are finding but we are trying to undercover like try to find a way to 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 uncover them and then to find a solution to make the movement stronger and stronger, which is what is happening. So we have more people on the board and, and we're trying to also to find a ways to reduce the, the lack of transparency and also to really put what the Spanish government is doing on, on the media. So also media and journalists has been very important for the campaign to really show and to publish the, the real information of the numbers, what they have been doing in, in Spain. Thanks so much for that, Celia. Um, and Neta, good to have you back. We've just been talking about some of the obstructions to various movements um, and some of the ways that people are working to sort of circumvent them. Um, I want to come to you with that question, but just before we get to that, talking a little bit more about the work that ISM is doing. In the last year around the world, we've seen mass disruptive direct action for Palestine, as we mentioned sort of in the introduction, from occupations and train stations and airports to blocking shipments of arms bound for Israel, which we've talked about, um, to massive university encampments. Can you tell us if this momentum has helped your work at ISM? And do you think we need more of this type of direct action, different types of direct action to continuously demand a ceasefire? Um, uh, yes, <laughs> we need more. Um, but I wanna say, and yes, it does help our work on the ground. I mean, and, a couple of ways. I mean, one thing is, of course, you know, the encampments and these actions is part of a way of, you know, informing other people about about what's happening in Palestine and inspiring them to 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 get involved. And some of the, the people from the encampments, for example, well, some of the people organizing these actions are people who have been to Palestine, and people who are get involved in the actions are people who come to Palestine. Um, some of them and get inspired. But I also want to talk about another aspect of it, which is how uh, the people here on the ground receive the information, you know, the fact that these actions are happening. Because, for example, with the encampments, people, I can speak for the people in the West Bank, you know, people were glued to their to their TVs watching the encampments, you know, here and watching you know, the, the drama in the U.S. unfold of people, of, of how the, the encampments were being attacked. And it really, um, these kind of actions when they're covered and when people hear 
see that in Palestinians, see that it 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 cuts through the sense of isolation uh, that people here experience when you know there's a genocide going on for a year and and nothing is happening. It's very easy to believe that they're alone and no one cares, which is exactly what Israel uh, wants us all to believe, and that it's you know, that it's a, that this is a losing, that we're alone and powerless. Um, because, so the cycle, for the psychological, um, you know, battle that everyone here is fighting to, to, to sustain hope uh, so that they can keep, continue the struggle, these actions, also the message that they send is very important also uh, here on the receiving end. Um, Thanks so much for that, Netta. Um, I'll maybe come to you, Karim, next. I know you've talked a little bit about it already in terms of the struggles with just being able to train and compete as Palestinian athletes. Are there any other challenges that you've been up against, um, either online or in real life, that you can talk about um, along with some of the ways that you've um, circumvented them? Yeah, sure. I mean... I'll just start off by starting a bit about the challenges on the ground. Something that we're all like very familiar with. We wake up and we go to the toilet. Pretty sure everyone in the audience goes to the toilet at some point after they wake up. And I have to my knowledge that somewhere in Zawaide refugee camp, there's a camp with no toilet, right? But right across the camp, there's a house. One of the last houses of anyone that I know in Gaza that still has a house. And every morning, my project manager can't start work until 9.30 in the morning because he takes a train of like 20 people from the camp into his brother's house so that they can use the toilet and then go back. And that's just to start his day. That's that's just to start his day. And it might sound funny because we're talking about going to the toilet, but damn, can you imagine if everything that you do has this kind of layer attached to it, even going to the toilet? How do you... How do you how do you operate? And so I guess this is the, the first thing on the ground, right? Like uh, consistent displacements, uh, consistent Wi-Fi blackouts, uh, fluctuations in food prices, food dropping off the market, on the market, any given point in time, problems with liquidity. There's no more cash in Gaza. It's all leaving. There's barely any coming in. The Israelis go into banks and loot the money that's in there whenever they get there. It doesn't help with the equilibrium of things. These are all just challenges on the ground. These are challenges that day by day affect different members of our team. It makes operating in this environment ridiculously difficult. That's obviously besides the psychological torment and the fear for the death of your family and your loved ones and you know the destruction of your houses. And there's, there's that whole thing. So the team on the ground, how do we deal with it? We deal with it by staying together. We really treat each other like a family. Um, we fight a lot. We make up a lot. There's a, a lot of space for, for that within the kind of thing. And so having a strong community, having a strong basis to relationships is so important in the movement. And I think that like when, as, as the years go on and the challenges grow, having a solid foundation in your movement is, is super important. Um, besides that challenges we faced, I mean, I've attacked, I've gotten attacked by right-wing protesters twice this year. Uh, once back in December, there were six of them that crowded us in a march. Uh, happened again like last month during the big ride for Palestine. Some random drunk guy came out of a pub and tried to attack one of the people I was riding with, had to step in. Um, yeah, these things are scary when they happen. I think having a de-escalatory mindset is, is key. These people are there to instigate violence. They're there for you to react. That's the whole reason. Um, so just don't react. Hopefully you can get out of it safely. Thankfully, both times we were safe uh, getting out of it. Uh, and social media, social media is a weird one. I think the sunburn is really how they start on social media. I mean, we're in Gaza, so you're not going to meet us, right? Or they were in Gaza, so you're not going to meet them. So social media was really this way to communicate with the world. It was going really good. And then we just got a shadow ban like last week on Instagram. Uh, and now we're, our Facebook page got taken down and our verification symbol got taken down and our interactions dropped for a long period of time. Um, and we got no explanation from Meta as to why it happened. And as a result, I've now gone and made my Instagram page public and I'm forcing all that to post more as well because we just need to diversify those kind of outlets. And I'd say that's like another recommendation is that don't 
rely on one social media platform or on one social media page because it will get taken down. It will get messed with. So I wish we'd started this months ago in retrospect, right? To keep with the same momentum and keep pushing things forward. Um, borders have always been a challenge. I mean, that's that's not a surprise. I think the panel knows and everyone knows here about how borders affect aid going in and aid going out. It's affected me and Alat meeting for five years. Um, it's currently separating our athletes from their families as well, which is causing all kinds of psychological torment to, to everybody involved in the project. So there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of challenges. Um, but I think the main way to overcome all of them is to have faith, is to remain hopeful, to remain optimistic, to keep thinking of the bigger picture. Whenever these small day-to-day -day things, not small day-to-day -day things, but whenever these day-to-day -day things come up and cause some kind of uncertainty or lack of structure, you just have to think about all the people that you can help push forward. Just because one guy is being chased by the army doesn't mean that they all are. And you end up doing this with everything in life and it, it creates some kind of balance that you can push forward. Thanks, Kareem. I wanted to pick up on something that you said around the importance of relationships within the movement and being able to really form those. Um, I guess to put that to you next, Netta, um, a few weeks ago, the American activist who was part of the International Solidarity Movement, Ayas Noor Ezgi, became the third member of ISM to be killed by Israeli soldiers since 2003. And you mentioned um, her name a little bit in your introduction as well. Tell us how the ISM movement is coping with this loss and what do these targeted killings tell us about the risks in confronting the Israeli regime as well as the threats Israel sees in this type of action? Sorry, Netta, you're just on mute. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, I guess um, there's kind of two two things I want to say about about the targeting of uh, of um, international volunteers, uh, and then. The, the the things that also Kareem talked about, like the silencing of uh, Palestine activism in, in general. Um, so like I mentioned before, um, Aishinur was the 18th uh, um, protester in Beta to be murdered. Um, and right now we have uh, two international volunteers who were uh, arrested from uh, Musafariyata from Twani, uh, while they were providing a uh, protective presence to um, a, a farmer there uh, whose garden every day is invaded by soldiers and settlers who harass him and the international by proxy. Um, but how, how, how we deal with it, I mean, I guess before I say how we deal with it, I want to say that you know, I mean, death of of of, of a human being is is you know it's, it's it really is like a whole world that um, is destroyed, and so many people uh, are affected by by this kind of violence. And at the same time, uh, not to contradict that, what we're experiencing is um, you know like a fraction of what. Palestinians are experiencing in terms of like whole families being wiped out, like being, um, you know, erased from the population registry that this family like just no longer exists. Like, I, I'm sure you all know this, but like everyone I know in Gaza has lost like double digits of family members and, and friends. And we still have, like while we are being targeted, um, we still have privilege that we can leverage. I mean, I should know we all know her name. There's, I can't even find out, you know, the names of all the Palestinians who were killed on the day uh, that Aisha was, that, that Aisha was killed. Um, you know, I used to, <laughs> in Palestine in the past, like just try, want to remember the names of all the martyrs. Like, and there's just no, there's no chance. And the fact that we know her name and we're working on holding uh, Israel accountable on getting the United States and Turkey um, 
to demand uh, independent investigation and accountability for her killers, for them to just know that maybe when they shoot the trigger, they'll get something uh, uh, rather than a pat on the back, um, you know, uh, and a promotion for killing someone. Um, like this, these little pinpricks in the impunity of the Israeli soldiers, uh, I think are incredibly important, you know, in making them possibly, you know, think before uh, before shooting that there might be some kind of uh, someone asking questions. And what I'll say about in terms of like how we deal with it, um, I mean, first of all, uh, volunteers that come to Palestine, they go through like training, many different levels of training in which we like uh, let people know of all the risks that they might be facing and we try to prepare them as much as possible to protect themselves from that those risks, which for example, Aisha and I did, you know, Tom and Rachel who were also murdered back in 2003, they did everything right. You know, she was in a safe place, hiding behind a tree, and you know she was, she was uh, executed because that's how the, the occupation, um, you know, no one is safe uh, facing facing the occupation. But the way that we deal with that as a movement is that you know because we know that she that all our volunteers are made as um, conscious of the risks. And then the fact that we don't have a hierarchy in our organization, that we work by consensus and that people like have to, like any concern that they have about something happening will be addressed. And there's never anything that people have to do. So basically the fact that we know that Aisha chose to be there um, and was aware of what she was doing uh, makes it for us as a movement uh, somehow more bearable, uh, not not easy in any way, um, but but we know that um, you know all of us have things. Not all of us, but those of us in the movement. There there are times where there's things that you're willing to risk your life for that they're important enough uh, for you to do that. And I personally, you know, I'm grateful that I was able to do that and at certain points in my life. And um, so the last thing that I'll say is that going back, circling back to like the fact that, you know, my Palestinian, the silencing is so intense and each one of us has different levels of, you know, a privilege of how much I can put myself out there. Like, what risk am I taking being here talking to you? You know, me living in Ramallah. Um, it, it's relative to the risk that my friends, my neighbors, you know, activists, who if they would be speaking now, you know, how much danger would they be in? And not they only personally, because the way that the Israeli occupation uh, operates and colonialism operates is that they threaten your family members. You know, it's very kind of, there's, always these mafia tactics, basically. So my Palestinian activist friends, if they were to be public here in the West Bank, they're not only endangering themselves, they're endangering their families. And in Gaza, of course, that endangering isn't, you know, here they get arrested and tortured most of the time, like activists and in Gaza for the same thing, like that I'm doing now here, you know, people, my friends have been murdered together with their families. So sharing the, you know, when I can't speak, I need you all to speak for me. And when my friends can't speak, they need me to speak for me. And when someone is shadow, shadow banned, we all have to pick them up and post their content. And, you know, they can target, they can target us individually and they can silence some of us. But this, that's why events like this are so important and networking is so important and us all working together is the hardest thing, but so important because really then we cannot be stopped. Thank you so much for that, Netta. Really powerful stuff. And I think really speaks to the human cost of this on all sides. And um, I don't think many people here lose sight of that, but it's just so important to reinforce. 
Um, we've got just over 25 minutes left, so I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for audience questions. We've had a couple come in already, but um, please feel free to type your questions in the chat and uh, we'll pose them to the panel. Um, one that did come in, uh, which maybe I'll start with you, Marin, and anyone else who has comments, feel free to jump in as well. But a question from Vanessa is, does the panel think that international attention shifting to Lebanon and Iran impacts negatively on solidarity with Palestine? Um, did you want to comment on that first, Maren? Well, my first reaction would be no. The fact that what is happening in Lebanon and the extension of uh, Israel's onslaught on Lebanon, not only Gaza and to uh, uh, a different uh, level, uh, the West Bank, but now the mass murders and complete destruction in Lebanon is just yet another reason why Israel has to be stopped now. Um, I don't think that that is uh, in itself taking away from uh, the solidarity. Um, what is uh, evidently Israel's game and Netanyahu's uh, particular logic is that if he is able to create a regional war and not only an onslaught of Israel on uh, Palestinians and Arabs, uh, Arab people across uh, uh, the region, then uh, Israel will be uh, uh, defined as the victim again by the uh, powers that be. But uh, this is at the moment not happening yet. And I think uh, the expansion of the onslaught uh, to uh, to Lebanon, which has continued over all those 11 years, uh, uh, 11 months and in the years before. So it's not really new when it's happening. It's just the uh, um, intensification of what has always been happening. It's just a reason more to say we need sanctions now. We need to uh, isolate apartheid Israel. And this is actually as well what is happening. Thank you, Maren. Um, Kareem, Katie, or Celia, did you want to add anything to that point? Will I come in for just a minute? Um, yeah, of course. yeah, I think I would basically agree with everything Maren has said. Um, I think the only thing maybe to add would be that it is just for us to counter our own governments when they use this escalation that was very clearly going to happen um, not to let that then kind of be taken over by this um, rhetoric on self-defense and that yes we have to send more arms now we you know for that they will be using this um, in terms of their own narratives and I think you know it's been unfortunately it's been this like horrific year where as a as a public we've like learned these lessons of how our political leaders are speaking to us and kind of seeing that that beginning of October, November, December, where none of the parties, not like late, sorry, none of the two, the two main ones, Labour and the Conservatives here in the UK, wouldn't even call for a ceasefire, you know, from their safe homes, um, well looked after, couldn't even bring themselves to do that. And now we've seen what's happened this year, and now we've seen the escalation. So while they might be, yeah, a, they might try and manipulate what's happening uh, to suit their agenda. But I think the public has never been more informed and aware as to what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, and we just need to keep countering it. Thanks, Katie. It's a really good point. And I think something that's come up a lot as well is uh, the lack of faith that uh, the people are increasingly losing trust in global systems. We've seen like we mentioned earlier, the, the seeming powerlessness of the UN, the ICJ and the ICC in, in holding Israel to account. We're seeing the complete um, apathy of our governments, to, to put it lightly. Um, where do you think, I guess two parts to this question, and this is to everyone on the panel. Firstly, where do we sort of derive hope from knowing that our supposed leaders are not um, acting in our best interests? And um, Part two of that question, I guess, is what should we focus our efforts on now? I know you all sort of work um, in your respective fields, but there is some linkages between them. 
where can we channel most of our energy um, going into this next year? Maybe I'll come to you first with that, Netta, not to put you on the spot. Yeah, I was still thinking. And I think, um, you know, I, I don't honestly, I, I don't feel like I'm qualified to tell people what they should be focusing on uh, in the next year, you know, in your own countries, I, I, I'm afraid to say. I can say that for myself, um, you know, one thing is, there's a genocide um, and how to support people, how to support people in surviving. Um, that's that's really important to me. It's important to me to be in touch with the people affected as much as I can. And that, uh, yeah, also fuels me to do like the other, like the political work. And then when talking about like supporting people to survive, it's something that somebody mentioned like, you know, having having community and building community and like we're we're this is a you know we're, we're we're going into this is such a difficult time and we will survive it you know together uh you know the, that's the only way <laughs> like either or or not like isolated um yeah i think it's it's not i can definitely speak for myself i i would not be able to to handle uh all the you know uh, pressure and grief and rage. So, so being connected with uh, with community, and then in terms of like politically, like what 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 we all need to be working on. I I I really feel like, you know, it's it's hard not to be frustrated. Um, you know, like it seems that everything we've done isn't working because we can't stop it. You know, and it's hard for me. It's it's. I, I try to keep in my mind like this image of like okay we're 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 like filling a, a an ocean possibly a pool of like we have to keep you know filling it and eventually it's gonna overflow like we're not there yet and it seems it seems like what we're doing well it's not having the effect that we want because it's not stopping the genocide let alone liberating Palestine um, but it's this accumulative effect that we knowing that we will uh, reach a tipping point um, of the things that we are doing, you know, the, the actions that all these, everyone here on the panel has been talking about, uh, BDS and getting our own, getting countries to withdraw uh, support from apartheid Israel. I'll say maybe one other thing that I feel that something that has happened, important thing that happened this year, nothing new, but I feel like it, it you know, in the consciousness that was that was raised this year, on on many levels, on the you know uh, mess that we're all globally in, and it's one you know we're all it's one struggle. Um, so the the narrative of Palestine as like, I feel that the narrative that many of us have known for a long time, but of Israel being a colonial entity. Um, and the Palestinians being, you know, the indigenous people that are being um, expelled for the resources of, you know, the land, uh, a story that, you know, most of us have in history, you know, can relate and, 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 and um, in our own history. So, and it's something like how people relate to Palestine has to do with how they relate to their own country's history of either colonizing or being colonized. Um, and most of us, and um, and I think that that you know somehow the 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 fact that Israel was able to you know make the refugees invisible and the right of return you know with the UN resolution you know was just kind of like this non non issue, um, at least for you know, I think it's really important that we remember that 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 is the issue you know that the issue is. Um, you know, equality, that the issue is return, you know, that the issue is colonialism, that it's not, that we don't, moving forward, um, you know, for me, like, waste, you know, all this, like, energy in this, like, in basically a Zionist narrative of the two-state solution and, um, um, you know, trying to present this, like, oh, there's these you know, there's two nations, there's neighbors fight dispute <laughs> uh, here. 
which somehow Israel has managed to sell uh, as, a, as a narrative to some people. So, so not letting that, I feel like we've gained that, um, you know, conscious raising of consciousness and we have to take care of it. Uh, we have to make sure that, that that's the narrative, um, you know, moving forward and it's kind of breaking into the mainstream. We have to keep it there. Thanks so much for that, Neta. Uh, Kareem, you had your hand up. Did you want to add anything else to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was going to comment on a few points made, I guess, but I'll keep it pretty brief. I think the main thing that we need to do is to stop being sad and to start being angry. Right? Like, it, it's so easy to get caught up in sadness and to channel all that anger into sad thoughts. No, you got to be angry. That's just like the, the first thing that everyone needs to do because... Yeah, sadness isn't going to get us anywhere. There's no time for despair. You need the emotion that's going to motivate you. When Ala is on his bike cycling, he's not thinking about how sad he is that his family can't be there. No, he's thinking about how angry he is about the situation that's going and he's letting that energy out onto the pedal, right? And the same way Ala lets that energy out onto the pedal, we need to be doing that respectively in all of our points in life, right? If you work in a company, and you see some shit with Israel. Sorry, excuse my language. Don't don't not speak about it. Don't don't hold yourself back. No, go and say something about it. Don't just be sad like, oh no, my company has investments with Israel or has a partnership with Israel. No, go up and say something. Be angry about it. Feel your full range of emotions. You're a human being. You have the capacity to do that. You know, you have a capacity to react as well. And when it comes to, I think, the situation with Lebanon and, 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 and Gaza and Gaza falling behind, there's always wars happening on this planet. There's always conflict. In Sudan, there's thousands of people dying. There, at any point of the last 76 years, there have been people dying. It's horrible. That's like one of the saddest realities of life. Um, what continues to make Gaza and Palestine different on the international level is that, you know, we're lucky that we can be related to by a lot of people, a lot of different causes. My dad always says we're lucky by the neighbors that we have, which is like he kind of says that, you know, maybe if Israel wasn't as important as it is to the West, the Palestinians <laughs> cause wouldn't be as central. Right. But it's such a central element to settler colonialism and to the existence of Western hegemony in the Middle East that it has become this central point for everybody. Right. It has become a symbol for that. That doesn't happen overnight. That's not something that the energy of a movement is going to kill. No, if. If, if there are certain things that we oppose, is it, it's this is it. This is the existence of a Western arm inside of our countries, displacing us, causing instability, and, and destroying our countries, effectively, one after the other. And so in a movement that's rooted in love, and this is always my basis for it, it's like we're all here because we care about things and we all care about people. Now there's a whole load of people in Lebanon that people care about and a whole load of people in Syria that people care about. We're not taking away from each other. We're just adding more care and more love and more hardship. But that hardship, that pain, that is that is an emotion. We have to feel comfortable with it as people. That is what's bringing us together collectively. And one thing that's significantly different, isolation is a, is a crazy political tool because no one cares about you if they don't know you exist, right? And Palestine has always been isolated. We don't have McDonald's. We don't have Starbucks. We don't have... And so when you start to think of like overall the world caring, I'm, I'm sad to say, I'm unfortunate to say that we, people don't care because we don't make the world money. People care for other reasons. More people have started to care, right? But I'm talking about the politicians and the people up top. Lebanon is a globalized, connected, thriving country with its own people, its own government, its own borders. It, it's not the same from a global perspective as attacking Palestine. Unfortunately, I wish we had the same stakes as the day that but we, we just don't. And so I think that this is an escalation on the global sphere, which is going to give more, like it's going to create a lot more political leverage in a single united goal, which is we all want the arms sales to Israel to stop, whether you're in Lebanon or you're in Gaza or you're in Syria or you're in a Jordanian refugee camp and you want to go back home to Palestine or you just want to be able to go and visit your family, you know, when the bombs stop, we're going to get what we want. And so I, it adds to this pressure and the common enemy is this idea that there's a people that is superior and that they deserve to exist on this land above me and my family. That's just the basis of it. So yeah, sorry for the rant, but it's just, this is this is my feeling towards it. So stop being sad, start being angry, get up and, and keep fighting because we've come a long way. That's, that's a for sure.
Thanks so much, Karim. And some really nice comments coming in through the chat as well that, um, you know, in spite of everything, we're facing these events are so important and it's um, really kind of up to all of us to carry on this momentum. So thanks so much for saying that. Um, Netta's just added to the chat another point for things that we can do is to amplify Palestinian voices and heeding their call, um, something that's been so important since the 7th of October last year um, and will remain important is elevating Palestinian voices as much as we can. Um, there's another question that's come through a slight um, change up is obviously we're a few weeks away from the US elections and possible results for either the Democrats or the Republicans. Uh, a question for the entire panel of uh, what impact might this election, regardless of the outcome, have on what we need to do. Um, maybe Mara and I can come to you first to put you on the spot this time. Sure. Um, I'll be again <laughs> very blunt. None. Um, while evidently there is uh, uh, a huge difference between uh, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, fact is that both of them um, have clearly expressed their support for Israel, for ongoing arms trade with Israel. Um, so we are at a point where both political parties uh, um, are still not uh, heeding what the people want. Um, it's not from the uh, it's not from the White House that uh, will come the change uh, for now for the next uh, four years. Uh, there has been a landslide uh, change within the Democratic Party electorate that now is uh, fully supportive of uh, a less pro uh, Israel politics and. Uh, of Palestinian, uh, the majority of Palestinian rights and against uh, arms deals, but that is unfortunately not expressed uh, neither by the Kamala Harris campaign nor by uh, by the Trump campaign, where evidently in the Repub uh, Republican Party, those uh, pressures, not even from the electorate, are there. Um, and I guess I would want to use that question as well a bit to, to answer to that further question that you had about uh, the frustration with uh, the institutions, because uh, my answer could as well bring to that, add to that frustration with the institutions. But I do think uh, that uh, we need to understand as well that uh, um, well, evidently, the White House has enormous power. When we're looking about the IC, at the ICC or ICJ uh, or other of those institutions, they don't have power. The idea is not that they have power. They tell us uh, what is right and wrong, what is legal and what, what is illegal within the framework of international law. And it gives us the people that are the ones that need to build the power to make the change another tool for action so that the ICJ decisions don't implement themselves. No, they won't. Uh, and that is not the idea. We can use them to implement them as the change in the US uh, will be coming slowly, not uh, through these elections, but through the encampments, through the work that has been done in the demonstrations, in the process, uh, protests, uh, like the change in the UK hasn't been coming from Keir Starmer. Uh, it has been coming from the people out in the streets day after day, week after week. And that is, and when we are seeing that there is a change starting up uh, in the UK government, that the international courts are on our side and that we're changing, then that actually is giving hope. It is us, the people that, that are moving, that are actually changing the, uh, uh, the positions of those uh, in power. And this is how it should be. Uh, so I would rather say there is uh, hope in what we've been seeing over the last uh, years in terms of changes. And uh, 
I mean, yes, there is the sadness and there, this uh, uh, needs to be transformed into anger and, and we need to keep that hope open uh, that is there. And we need to be strategic in realizing that even if we have still not anti-genocide, still six, 76 years after the beginning of uh, uh, Israel's apartheid regime, it's still alive and kicking strategically looking at the advantages that we're doing, and as well strategically looking at how we are ensuring we are not being uh, targeted by repression or others, but avoid the repression wherever we can, face it if you have to, but avoid it wherever we can in order to move forward and to build towards changing the institutions and not expecting they will do the job for us. Thanks so much for that, Marin. Um, I, in preparing for this last night, saw a post from uh, Lina Abirafe, who's a Lebanese American women's rights expert, activist, aid worker. Um, and she had written a blog in the aftermath of um, the UN General Assembly. And in that, she said, I've dedicated my decades to institutions I am now struggling to believe in. One thing hasn't changed my belief in individuals. When the institutions set up to protect us are failing, we need to step in. It's up to us now. If the world's leaders, whose duty it is to represent and defend us, refuse to protect us, then we're going to have to do it ourselves. No one is coming to save us except us. And I think kind of as scary as those words are, I think they're very true. And I think a lot of what all of the speakers have said today really speak to that and the importance of us as individuals coming together and that there is real power in our movements and there is uh, real hope to to be derived from all of them. Um, so we've just got a few minutes left. If there's no more um, questions, I guess last call for questions from the audience. Um, I will just come around to the panelists for any final remarks. Um, like I said, we'll be distributing a recording of this uh, whole event uh, via email, as well as posting it on our YouTube channel. Um, uh, along with further readings and ways to get involved with uh, each of the organizations um, and movements that are here today. Um, but I'll hand it back to the panel if anyone would like to make any final comments before we wrap up. Uh, I'll pick that. I'll pick up that glove. Um, so my final comments would be, um, one thing that I've been wanting to say is that uh, just encouraging all of us to to be creative, you know. Like we need, we need to. There are there are things. While I'm while I am saying there are things that are working, and we have to continue even if we don't see immediate results. Uh, we do have to be creative now and think of of new ways to address uh, what's happening. And 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 you know, I mean, I don't know when I think of. Uh, um, yeah, the, there are the movements that 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 you know appeared of things that uh, didn't happen before <laughs> that are happening now. Like, uh, and uh, this is what I feel is 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 needed now. And I'll qualify that uh, in saying that you know I think I've said this many times before, and I'm going to say it again. In, uh, grounding our activism in being in touch with Palestinians taking their lead when it's about Palestine, um, but being in touch with colonized people, being in touch with the colonized. And and that like, you know, there's kind of like, I feel like everyone from the, at least from the people who come from colonizing nations that are, are here um, have probably um, gone through our own, I believe that the people here have gone to some level through our own process. You know, it's a painful process uh, recognizing, um, you know, um, the parts of our, you know, the colonized parts of our own mind, you know, maybe, you know, even colonized people have, 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 uh, that kind of work to do, but definitely people who come from, um, colonizing societies, you know, we have to look at ourselves and, and, and dismantle, um, um, our own, um, you know the ideas that we get about our own entitlement and superiority and different that this world um, is kind of running according to 
you know, like where, like at least for white people, how uh, our lives are valued. Um, yeah, I was thinking before we started today that, that like, you know, if if my friend um, uh, Wafa was was a Jewish woman and she and her husband and children were murdered in the way that they were, like what kind of, you know, the whole world would be talking about it right now. Um, and those things, so just to say that there's also an internal process that we have to, you know, keep ourselves and each other uh, in check as we do this work, that we're not like repeating these kind of colonial um, uh, patterns that we uh, that we live in in our movements. Um, and uh, yeah, I I I, I um, extend the invitation of the people here to you that it would be great to see you in Palestine. Uh, obviously in a free Palestine, inshallah, soon. But until then, in, in working together to, to, to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Nessa. I think that's a perfect note to end on, um, just right on time. Um, thank you so much to all of you. I know it's getting a little bit late in the evening for some of you as well. So thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been a real honor to be here and to host you all. Um, so we'll be in touch with links in the recording. Um, until then, uh, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And um, we will speak to you all soon. Good night, everyone. Thank you to you and new internationalists. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.